guys, it's Eric here at Farpoint Farms. Today, we're continuing our series on solar panels, solar arrays, solar setups. It's the beginner's guide and we're at part five. Today, we're gonna to be talking about inverters. The inverters are probably the most confusing part of the system uh, for most people because you get, you get numbers. Well, this is a 3000 watt inverter and you run the illusion that you can actually run everything they'll run under 3000 watts, which is true and also false. First of all, what is an inverter? And so the system itself, that your solar array, is going to be putting out DC voltage. Whether it's 12 volts, 24, 36, or 48, it doesn't matter. It's a DC voltage. And you need a way to convert that over to AC voltage to use with your household appliances. Do you want to run a refrigerator or a TV set or a fan? Those are all operating here in the U.S. anyway at 120 volts AC. If you want to run something more significant like a well pump or a heat pump, well, those are operating at 240 volts AC. And so you need an inverter capable of converting those voltages from 12 or 24 or 48 to those higher AC voltages. That's what inverter does. It's a little bit confusing because you can go out and you look online and you say, well, look at this, this is a 3000 watt, 120 volt uh, converter or inverter. And so, well, I'll just pick that up and that way I can run everything. You're right, you can. But what you're missing out on and what a lot of it's like buried into the paperwork of these units is they have what's called a parasitic load, a parasitic draw on them. So even when all the lights are off and all the power's off on everything that you're trying to power up, when we shut the TV off the night, the fans are turned off, lights are turned off, the refrigerator isn't even cycling, that's great. You would think you were drawing zero watts, zero, you know, no energy going through the system. But an inverter actually does have what's called an idle amount of use, idle draw or parasitic draw. And the larger the inverter, the higher the amount of wattage that it's capable of putting out, the higher the amount of draw you're going to have. So it's important for you to size your system correctly. And it's funny because the entire video that a, a series that I've made here, I talk about how you don't want to have to buy stuff two or three times because you can decided to upsize your system. But in the case of inverters, it's actually probably a better idea that you not oversize your inverter because that draw can be quite significant. Purchasing a 3000 watt inverter will run everything in your house, no problem, but it's also gonna have an idle load of about 100 watts. That's a lot of juice. Take 100 watts times 24, 2400 watt hours, you're, you're burning up a lot of energy. That's, that's a lot of energy. That is many hundred amp hours of storage that you're gonna to have to have and a whole lot of solar to recharge it. So it's important not to oversize your inverter. For instance, if I were going to set up a small car camper, a, a van camper, right, and I had 200 watts of solar on the roof, and I had a 100 amp hour battery and a small PMW or PWM uh, in, uh, controller, I would probably want to get something in the 800 watt range as far as an inverter goes. If I was going to be operating a full size RV and perhaps I had 400 watts of solar coming in, I had an MPPT controller and I had 200 amp hours worth of batteries, well then maybe I would consider moving up to a uh, 1500 watt. With 1500 watts, you can run a microwave, uh, you can run a, heat, a, a blow dryer, you could run a coffee pot, you can pretty much run all household appliances that are high draw appliances. You can't run them all at the same time, but you could run them. And in the case of an RV, it's also a lot easier just to flip the switch off. When you go to bed at night or when you're done using your uh, equipment for the day, you can kill power to the inverter and that way you don't have your parasitic draw. But when it comes to whole house systems, partially like what we're going for, which is a hybrid system where we'll still have power coming in from the grid, but we'll also be running mostly off grid through the solar setup, that static, that idle, that idle current, which is 100 watts an hour for a large system like the one we're installing, it takes a lot to overcome. So when you're sizing your system, if you're going to go for that, you have to take that into account. Instead of 3,000 watts, maybe you need 4,000 watts just to compensate for the amount of draw that that unit itself is going to take. Now, they also have different phases, right? The regular household current in a house is 120 volts. If you're just going to be running a few items, and the original setup we have, which is 1,200 watts of solar, we have a 2,000 watt inverter, and it runs just four or five outlets on one side of the house. We run some of the equipment we need, and it works fine. But if I want to run the well pump, and it's a big deal to run a well pump when the power's out, it's important to have what's called split phase wiring. And that adds a lot of cost. 
To get an inverter that offers split phasing means you're having two legs of 120, you end up with 240 volts, and you're set up and more ready to hook up to what's called a transfer switch, which is something I'll get into in the next video, that allows you to move circuits on and off the grid as you need them. It's used for generators, for gasoline generators, diesel generators, but it's not commonly used for solar setups as most people either are all the way on the grid, all the way off the grid, or what's called grid tie, which I'll get into in another video as well. I guess that'll do it. The only other thing I want to mention to you today is that in recent years, the inverter and the solar charge controller are now becoming more and more one solid unit. There are some advantages to that. I mean, lower overall cost when you just buy one unit. Less wiring means less issues with maybe having an accident or having something set up wrong. But the downside to them is that when one part goes bad, the whole system has gone bad. Where a charge controller could continue to charge batteries while you replace a failed inverter, or you could continue to run your equipment after a failed charge controller off of batteries while you wait for replacement, when both units fail because they're combined together, it's an all or nothing kind of event. Just something to keep in mind. We are, however, going with a combined unit. I was lucky enough to get a hold of one that is a split phase 240. And of course, in another series altogether, you'll be coming along with me on that ride as we upgrade our system and I show you how to install all this stuff. That'll do it for tonight. The next part of this series is a shorter one. We'll be talking about transfer switches and home setups in particular. I hope to see you then. Take care.